Hello class, welcome to the second and final segment in lab 7, and in this final segment we're going to take a look at photographs and see how they can be used to diagnose uh, two other types of vorticity, which, can, which are referred to as streamwise and crosswise vorticity. But first, we're going to actually have to take a look at a photograph and get sort of an understanding on how exactly those work. So, excuse me, let's go ahead and start off by taking a look at an example photograph which you see plot on the screen here. Of course, if you follow any sort of severe weather events online, then you've probably seen at least one of these during the course of a, course of a potential severe weather event. A lot of people like posting these. But uh, here you're going to actually take, we're actually going to take a look at how exactly these photographs are plotted and what exactly they mean, especially as it pertains to uh, storm scale vorticity. So in the previous segment, we talked about uh, curvature and shear vorticity, which is more of a synoptic scale and mesoscale perspective on vorticity. Crosswise and streamwise vorticity is more of a storm scale, so it's more of like a micro scale or lower end mesoscale perspective on the amount of spin that's present in the atmosphere. But one thing that should be noted right away about photographs is they're plotted on a polar coordinate system. So that's in contrast to a Cartesian coordinate system. On a Cartesian coordinate system, a particular point on the graph is represented by a component in the x direction along the x axis and a component in the y direction or along the y axis. And a polar coordinate system, a particular point on the graph is represented as a distance to the a distance to the origin and an angle with respect to an axis, which typically in most of your math classes you use the x the positive x axis as a reference for the angle, but you could use any axis at all if you really wanted to. So again, polar coordinate system represented by a particular any point along the graph is represented as an angle and a distance to the origin. So that's what we've got going on in the photograph. The photograph is in fact a polar coordinate system and the way that this works is the farther away you are from the origin, the stronger the wind speed is. And the angle with respect to the origin or the uh, angle that you have here basically represents the direction that this, uh, the wind is moving. And the way that you go and plot an actual photograph is you start at the lowest level that you have data for. You plot that wind vector, so you plot the speed of that wind and the direction of that wind, and then you go to the next level up, so you go up in altitude, plot the next wind vector, and then just continue that cycle, plotting more and more wind vectors as you go up into the atmosphere, and you'll get a whole bunch of points. And then to actually draw the photograph, you'll just simply connect all those dots. So you play a simple game of connect the dots, connect all those points, and that'll give you this line, which uh, more or less tells you what exactly the wind is doing as you're going up into the troposphere or as you're going up in altitude. But uh, one thing that, again, is worth iterating is the way that this works is the distance from the origin represents the strength of the horizontal wind speed. And you can see they, I have these uh, dashed circles uh, uh, getting a, as you get farther away, the, the labels and the, num the numbers go up, and that's basically how, that's just how a photograph uh, is, uh, is drawn. As you get farther away from the, uh, the origin, as you get farther away from the center of the graph, and you're going towards stronger and stronger wind speeds. So in this particular case, I've got one point here, which is between 10 and 20 knots, and then i got another point here that's a 30 knot wind, and then this point right here is a 40 knot, a 50 knot, and theoretically the photograph could go out for, uh, it goes out to infinity, but uh, you usually won't get winds in the atmosphere over 200 knots. In fact, getting something over 100 knots is somewhat unusual to see on a photograph, but it does happen on occasion. And the angle with respect to the origin tells you something about the wind direction. And this could be slightly confusing at first, but the, the way that this works, to get the direction of the wind, what you do is you take a particular point on the photograph, draw a line from that point to the origin, and the direction that line points, that's the direction from which the wind is coming from. So if we take a look at the base of the photograph, which is at the lowest level that we have data for, if we take that particular point in the photograph and draw a line, you can see I've got a line that points in the south-southeast direction. So that tells me that my wind is coming from the south-southeast direction. It's a south-southeasterly wind. And as we go up along the photograph, as we go along the line, which means we're going up in altitude, we get a point here where if we draw that line, so let's take this point, draw a line to the origin, now I've got a line that's pointing in the due south direction, which means my wind is due south at this particular level in the atmosphere. And then as I go up even further, so I'll say go over here, and I connect one of these points with the origin, I'm getting a line that's pointing in the southwest direction, southwest direction which means my wind is coming from the southwest, so my wind starts off blowing in this uh, being a south-southeasterly wind 
and then it becomes more southerly, and then it becomes southwesterly as we go up in altitude. So that's how you can determine how the direction of the wind is changing using this idea of the hodograph. So again, the way that you get the wind direction from the hodograph is you take the point that you're interested in, connect that point with the origin, and the direction that line points tells you from what direction the wind is coming from. And these closed circles that have the numbers in them, those are in fact altitude markers, and that tells you what the altitude of that particular wind speed is in kilometers. So right around at zero kilometers, which is basically at ground level, the wind is pretty close to 20 knots, I'd say about 17 knots south-southeasterly wind. And we go up to about one kilometer, we've got a wind that's about 65 knots, and that's a, about a south-southwesterly wind. And then, you can't really see it on this one, but there's two kilometers, three kilometers, four, five, and six kilometers. So once we get above two kilometers, the wind direction doesn't really change that much, because it's, it's just all southwesterly. But from zero to two kilometers, the wind direction really changes. It goes from south south southeast to southwest in the course of about two kilometers. So there's a lot of directional wind shear in this particular profile. And this open circle right here labeled RM, that's an estimate of what direction a cyclonically rotating supercell would actually want to move if put inside this environment. And I do stress that this is an estimate. This is based on a technique uh, which stems from, I believe it's a bunker's right motion, which is based on a research publication. And that's just the most widely used technique for estimating the uh, direction and speed of a supercell. And the way that you uh, obtain this is you take a line from the origin, and again, it's the same convention. You take a line from the origin, connect it to this open circle, and that tells you what direction the storm will want a right-moving supercell or a cyclonic supercell would actually want to move. And in this case, it's going to move pretty close to northeast, and the circle sits between the 50 and 60 knot uh, 50 and 60 knot distances from the origin, so that tells us the supercell thunderstorms will want to move at a speed of roughly 55 knots in the northeast direction. So those supercells are going to be booking it in this environment. <laughs> They're going to be moving 50, pretty close, 55 knots. That's uh, roughly uh, around 70 miles per hour. So those storms are really going to be moving. So that's just a sort of a general overview. There's some other symbols on here, which we'll cover during the course of the lecture, but for your immediate purposes in the lab, I'm only covering what you need to complete the lab. But now that we hopefully have a basic understanding of what the hodograph represents and how it works, 